That's where you see. Well, sometimes in life, it seems as if all hell has broken loose. The gates of hell are open wide and great evil and destruction are poured out. Maybe certain times in recent history come to your mind. Hitler and the Holocaust, Pol Pot and the Killing Fields, Putin and Ukraine. Maybe certain times in your own life come to mind when darkness has invaded like a flood. The worry of ill health, the emptiness of bereavement, the stabbing pain of someone doing evil against you. Now, the Bible does not shy away from these dark realities. Our chapter this morning records a particularly dark day in the history of Israel, a day in which 85 priests of the Lord are brutally slaughtered at the hand of King Saul. But the Bible does give us hope in these dark realities. And so through this great darkness in this chapter, a ray of light shines brightly through the darkness. This chapter brings us face to face with the powers of hell, showing us just how evil and destructive they are. But this chapter also brings us face to face with God himself, who can keep us safe in these dark and destructive times. And so the message of this chapter is very simple this morning. Given how evil and destructive the powers of hell are, flee from them. And given the goodness of God and how he can keep us safe, flee to him. First then, flee from evil. Look with me as we begin at verses 18 and 19, horrific verses. Then the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob the city of the priests he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey and sheep he put to the sword. Now, this great outpouring of evil has been rumbling in Saul's soul for many months. A bit like a volcano rumbling away until it finally erupts. If you look back with me at chapter 16, verse 14, this describes the seminal moment. Verse 16. So chapter 16, verse 14, the moment when the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul and an evil spirit torments him. Just tracing it through, chapter 16, verse 23, the evil spirit greatly agitated him such that he had to be calmed with David's music. Into chapter 18, the spirit, the evil spirit, filled Saul with a jealousy and anger towards David, chapter 18, 6 to 8. It made him rant and rave, verse 10 of 18. And all of this led to a deep hatred towards David and an intent to kill him. And we see this played out in chapters 18 to 21, on numerous occasions, both directly and indirectly, Saul is trying to kill David. But on each occasion, God keeps David miraculously safe. And you can sense the frustration building in Saul as time and time again his plans to kill David are thwarted. You can sense the anger rising as he fails to eliminate David. And now as we come into chapter 22, this evil that's been bubbling away and building up in Saul's heart now erupts 
in the most hideous way. Saul's frustration is initially directed at his servants, whom he accuses of withholding intelligence from him. Verse 8, all of you have conspired against me. No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. And you can imagine Saul's servants gathered around, absolutely terrified of their master, who's pretty much lost his mind at this point. But one of them pipes up. And this isn't an Israelite, this is a man from Edom, Doeg, verse 9, who says, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Elimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. And so here at last for Saul is a vital piece of intelligence. And quick as a flash, he summons uh, Imelech and all the priests of Nob. There then follows the most ridiculous inquisition. Uh, Imelech pleads uh, not just for his own innocence, but David's innocence. And of course, we, the reader, know that he's absolutely right. He's completely innocent, as is David. But Saul's mind is already made up. Verse 16, you shall surely die, Elimelech you and all your father's house. Now, there are several details in this massacre that makes it all the more appalling. First of all, Elimelech, as we've seen, is clearly an innocent man. He's not given a trial, let alone a fair one, but he's sentenced to death on the whim of the rage of the king. Secondly, it's not just Elimelech who's put to death, 85 priests of the Lord were put to death that day. Even if Elimelech was guilty, the other men had nothing to do with David's visit to know. They knew nothing about it, they were completely innocent, and yet they were put to death. Thirdly, of course, these were not ordinary men, these were priests of the Lord. That is, they were holy and anointed of God. If you look at verse 17, originally Saul asked for the guards to kill the priests, but we read in that verse that the servants of the king would not put their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. This is just underlying what a horrific thing Saul is doing and putting to death these men of God. So Saul had to use Doeg, the Edomite, to do his dirty work, verse 18. No Israelite could be found to do such an unspeakably wicked thing. Only a man from Edom, which was the arch enemy of God's people. Fourthly, and to top it all, verse 19, Doeg turned to indiscriminate killing in the city of Nob. Completely innocent men, women, and even children and animals were slaughtered that day. Now let's pause for a moment. As we read this and as we imagine it, all sorts of emotions rise up within us. All sorts of questions come immediately to mind when this sort of thing happens. Why did God allow it? Why didn't God protect those priests as he protected David? Why didn't the Lord strike Saul and Doeg before they did such an evil thing? And these are the sorts of questions that always come up when evil erupts in the world in, in, in our lives. Why? Why did God allow such a thing? Now, this chapter does not give us the answers that we want. 
In fact, the Bible as a whole doesn't give us nice, easy, specific answers to these sorts of questions. And I think the reason is because what we are interested to find out is not always what God is interested to show us in his word. What God wants to show us this morning in his word is just how evil and destructive the powers of hell are. That's the point. So we are absolutely right to be stirred up by this chapter. We're absolutely right to be angered and appalled by the injustice and the wickedness that we see here. But we are quite wrong to start questioning God as if he were to blame. God is not behind this wickedness. The devil is. Remember, Saul was not driven by the spirit of God at this point. He's driven by an evil spirit. These events are not from heaven, but from hell. And how the devil loves to do his worst and then get us to point the finger at God. Rather, let's see the evil for what it is. And let's point the finger in the right place at hell and the devil so that we flee from evil. You remember the story in the Gospels where Jesus delivers a man plagued by evil spirits, a whole legion of demons, and he brings them out of the man and he drives them into a herd of pigs. And the possessed pigs then run down the hillside into the sea and are drowned. The man who was possessed is now in his right mind, and 2,000 pigs are dead. What are we to make of that? Well, the people at the time wanted Jesus gone. They wanted nothing to do with him. They saw the destructive power, 2,000 dead pigs, and they blamed Jesus. And how often people do the same today. We look at the dead priests in Nob, we look at the Holocaust, we look at the killing fields, we look at Ukraine, we look at our own suffering, and we blame God and we turn away from him. Brothers and sisters, the point of this is not that we're to flee from God, but that we're to flee from evil. God is not the author of these things. The devil is. And so we're to see how utterly evil and destructive are the powers of hell. And then we're to run for our life from them. Flee from evil. What does that mean in our lives? It means taking a long, hard look at our own lives and our own hearts. Where we see evil in our own heart, we're to flee from it because it will destroy us and others if we don't. Where we see lust, greed, pride, deceit, we're to flee from it or it will destroy us and others. Where we see anger and malice and envy, we're to flee from it or it will destroy us and others. You see, sometimes evil is not so obvious as here. Sometimes it's very subtle and deceptive. Sometimes we kid ourselves into thinking it won't do us any harm, or it might even be fun in some way, or do us good. We are to see the destruction that evil unleashes, evil in all its forms, and we're to flee from it. Flee from evil. Secondly, our chapter urges us to flee to God. As well as seeing the utter evil of evil, 
let us also see the utter goodness of God. As well as seeing the destructive nature of the powers of hell, let us also see the safety of being in the hands of God. Through all the destructive evil brewing and erupting in Saul's heart, God is keeping David in a safe place. At the beginning of the chapter, that safe place, verse 1, is a cave in Adullam. And in that place, God draws to David, his family, and a bunch of about 400 loyal men to support him, verses 1 and 2. Now, God's idea of a safe place isn't always ours. We might have chosen a hotel in Barbados, surrounded by a bunch of lovely middle-class stable friends. God chooses a cave in Adullam, in the middle of nowhere, and he brings about a group of ruffians and down and outs for David to be kept company with. Actually, these men choose to be utterly loyal to David and just what he needed at the time. Although not the most comfortable of homes and company, this was God's way of keeping David shielded and protected from all the evil that was being outpoured from Saul. From there, David le God leads David to Moab, verses 3 and 4, to a stronghold. And here David finds safety for himself and his family. And then verse 5, David is led by the word of the Lord through the prophet back to Judah and into a forest. So notice how God is directing David, directing him to safety. As evil is erupting, the Lord has David in the safe place, away from the destruction. And this theme of safety continues at the end of the chapter as one of the priests of Nob, Abiathar, escapes, verse 20, and he runs, he flees, to David. And David says to him, verse 23, stay with me, do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me, you shall be in safe keeping. So let's this morning see ourselves in Abiathar's shoes, running for our lives from evil, fleeing from evil, running to David for safety. David is a type of Christ, Messiah. Abiathar flees to David where he finds safety. We flee to Christ, our King, the anointed of God, where we find safety. So the great message of this chapter is that although the gates of hell are sometimes open wide against the kingdom of God, those gates will not prevail. This happens many, many times throughout Bible history, that the hellish gates are open wide, the kingdom of God is threatened, but each time against all the odds, God preserves a remnant. He preserves his kingdom. Just as a few examples, Think of in Exodus as Pharaoh orders the death of all the Hebrew boys. God keeps Moses in a safe place. When Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, God keeps Elijah in a safe place. When Haman sought to kill all the Jews, God keeps the nation safe. Here, when Saul seek, kills the priests of the Lord, God keeps Abiathar safe. Into the New Testament, when Herod uh, seeks to kill all the Jewish boys, God keeps Jesus safe. When the Jewish leaders conspired with the Romans to put Jesus to death, God brought him back to life. And when the Jewish leaders seek to stamp the church out, God causes the church to grow. No wonder uh, Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
That's such a powerful and true statement. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, just as the devil is doing his worst and trying to kill the church. God is using that to grow his kingdom. No wonder Jesus himself said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that statement has held true for 2000 years and will continue to hold true to the end of time. And so it's in the church, in the kingdom of God, trusting in Christ as saviour, that's where we find the safe place from evil and destruction. Martin Luther, the great reformer, knew great strife in his life and ministry. And he bravely stood up against the evils that he saw in the church of his day. And although all hell broke loose around him, God preserved him and kept him safe and used him to bring about the great reformation of the 16th century. And it was out of this experience of God keeping him safe when all hell broke loose that he wrote the great hymn that we still sing today, a safe stronghold, our God is still. Let me quote some of the, uh, the great truths from that hymn that this chapter also presses upon us this morning. And the language is a bit clunky because, of course, it's a translation from German and the uh, translators were trying to get it to rhyme and fit, so it's a slightly clunky language, but you get the force of what he's saying. With force of arms we nothing can, for soon were we downridden, but for us fights the proper man whom God himself hath bidden. Ask ye who is this same? Christ Jesus is his name, the Lord Sabaoth's son, he and no other one shall conquer in the battle. And were this world or devils over and watching to devour us, we lay it not to heart so sore, they cannot overpower us. And let the prince of ill look grim as e'er he will, he harms us not a whit, for why his doom is writ, a word shall quickly slay him. And the last verse, God's word, for all their craft and force, one moment will not linger, but spice of hell shall have its course, tis written by his finger. And though they take our life, goods, honour, children, wife, yet is their profit small. These things shall vanish all. The city of God remaineth. Flee from evil, that evil which is so dark and destructive, Flee from it in all its forms and flee to God, the only God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is good and strong to keep us safe. The God whose kingdom cannot fail, the God against whom the gates of hell will not prevail. The God who one day soon will destroy all evil and establish his good kingdom forever. Let's pray together. We praise you, our Heavenly Father, that your kingdom cannot fail, that your kingdom is forever. And we praise you that the kingdom of darkness will be destroyed. 
And we praise you, Father, that even in this dark world, there is the safe place in Christ. And so, Father, help us to take these lessons to heart. Help us to turn from the evil that will destroy us. And help us to turn to you, you who will keep us safe, the only one who can keep us safe. And so, Father, help us to continue in your kingdom till the end, when finally we see your kingdom bursting through and the kingdom of darkness fading forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing in response to his